When we talk about the New Covenant or the New Testament, we're talking about the heart of God. Actually, about what God has always intended to do. This is God's original plan. It's not a reactionary plan. God was not readjusting his posture when man sinned. And I want to deal somewhat with that tonight. Several places in the word of God, and the thrust of God's word is what I'm going to say here. Several places in God's word, God divulged his intention. That's the burden of scripture. You can read the word of God to find out what you ought to do. Of course, that's not why it was written. Now, what you ought to do is in there. Make no mistake about it. But the word of God is God divulging. Or to put it in language of scripture, he's showing his covenant. He's showing his intention, an eternal intention, an eternal purpose. Several times in scripture, he stated this purpose from different perspectives. The first time he stated it, he couldn't contain himself. He preached the gospel to the devil and the whole human race is present. And it's found in Genesis, the third chapter. And you'll recall he said to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He'll bruise your head, you'll bruise his heel. The purpose in a nutshell from this perspective was, God's intention was, and it's going to be fulfilled utterly, absolutely, to frustrate the devil at every corner. To utterly frustrate him, the ark foe, the one with more cunning and crafty wiles than anyone else. But that was just his intention in embryo. A little later he expanded it. He expanded on it to Abraham. He says, shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I shall do? He wanted to divulge it. He couldn't wait uh, till the first century, to divulge this, the purpose was too big. This time he come at it from a little different angle. He said, my intention is to bless the whole world. That's my intention, that all nations of the earth will be blessed. Amen. Later, through the Apostle Paul, he stated the purpose from a little different angle. He said, this is God's intention, whom he foreknew he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son." Whom he predestinated, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. So there it is, the purpose from another angle. And one other one in Ephesians, the third chapter, he said, Now in the principalities and powers and heavenly places, he's making known his manifold diverse wisdom to the church. That's another aspect of it. I'm telling you these things because his, the covenant, the new covenant, is new from the standpoint of opening it up from its old from the standpoint of purpose or objective. Amen. I'm going to affirm tonight that the new covenant is actually the first covenant. Amen. Yeah. It's actually the original one. This is revolutionary in theology. You know, there's theology today that says the time clock stopped. God's prophetic time clock stopped and we're in some kind of a juncture period here. Well, this is a lot of gobbledygook. God's time clock never stopped. He purposed this before the world began, the scripture said. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. Amen. Before I touch upon this, I want to just defuse one little, uh, one, one little myth. Particularly from circles to which I have been exposed, there's a tendency, as Brother Harold has told us very well, to regard the new covenant as a moral code or a law. One of the scriptures that people use to undergird this is James 1.25 and James 2.12 that refers to the perfect law of liberty. And so they say the new covenant is a perfect law. They never accentuate liberty. These people never accentuate liberty. They never say it's the perfect law of liberty. See? They don't say that. They say it's the perfect law of liberty. That's what it is. They seem blissfully unaware that their definition of law is diametrically opposed to liberty. You could not put their version of law and liberty together. But they've got it together in the same book, believe it or not. See, the law is not a perfect law of liberty. The uh, law principle is not a law of liberty because it cannot impart life. 
A perfect law has got to impart life. It's got to do it. The human race is dead in trespasses and sins, and it has to have life. Galatians 3.21 says that the law, if there could have been a law that could have imparted life, then life would have come by the law. We would never have needed a new covenant if any law could have done it. Moses' law would have done it. It's the best moral code, not the worst. It's holy and just and good. That's not said of any other law. So the perfect law of liberty is another word for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's when the law is put inside and you're liberated to come to God. And you're liberated to serve him. An inward law is infinitely more demanding than an outward one. All right, now I want to get into the Abrahamic promise. I say that because when I say it, that the new covenant is a promise, see, that sounds, that sounds foreign to someone that views the new covenant as a law. Law and promise, <laughs> these are not the same thing at all. The promise is found in the book of Genesis, the 12th chapter. I'm going to read several restatements of this. It was given to Abraham. It was... Uh, reaffirmed to Isaac, and it was again confirmed to Jacob. Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3, you'll remember this text. The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. What a promise. Unilateral, any way you look at it. One-sided, any way you look at it. Again in Genesis 18, 17 and 18, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. It's a promise. Genesis 22, verse 17 and 18, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. I will do it. To Isaac he said, I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because Abraham that obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac's blessed because of what somebody else did. Abraham did it. Isaac got the blessing. Great principle to be seen here. You might call it a vicarious blessing. Genesis 28, 14. Here it is to Jacob. Thy seed shall be as a dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in thy seed, in thee, and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. A promise given to Abraham that involved universal global blessing. Global blessing. I have had it with provincial religion. Jesus brought an end to provincial religion. He said, pull up the tent stakes and spread the tent abroad because the children of the barren are going to be more than the children of the married. God has targeted a big thing in the new covenant. This promise made to Abraham of blessing the whole world is a golden thread that's woven throughout all of Scripture. In the book of Exodus, the book of Matthew, the book of Mark, the book of Luke, God is called the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. To my knowledge, he's not called the God of Peter and the God of Paul. Or the God of Apollos or the God of Luke. But he's called the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Why? 
Because of the promise and commitment he made to them. He wants to be identified with what he said to them. I will bless the whole world. That's God's intention. From the day the eternity and eternity when the Lord laid out the foundation of the world. His intention was to for blessing to pervade the entire globe. For humanity to be blessed. David talked about this very same thing. In 1 Chronicles 16, verses 16 and 17. Even the covenant which he made with Abraham, and of his oath unto Isaac, and hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. And what does he mean for a law? It's not a law in the ordinary sense of the word. It's a sense used in Jeremiah 31. We've read several times Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. <clears throat> now I want to read verse 35 through 37. Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, which divides the sea. When the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Well, the sun's still shining and the moon's still shining. And the stars are still shining and the waves are still lapping up on the shores of the sea. And that's another way of saying God's saying, I'm not going back on this word. Amen. This is going to come to pass. It was written once in scripture. And it repented the Lord that he made man. But it has not been written since. God has determined to bless humanity. David referred, you see, to that covenant. <clears throat> Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, when his tongue was loosed and he began to speak, he talked about this. Luke 1, 70. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Now as you read these, and there are many other references to this promise in scripture. We're going to cover a few of them. The remarkable breadth of this promise is staggering. When it was first given to Abraham, it seemed very brief and very small. But as it's elaborated on through scripture. Well, let me give you ten things that were seen in this, these promises. That were just in these texts that I read. First of all, he's going to make a great nation out of Abraham. Then he says, he'll make Abraham's name great. Then he says, I'll make Abraham a blessing. Then he says, I'll bless those that bless Abraham. I'll curse those that curse him. I'll give Canaan to Abraham's descendants. Abraham's descendants will spread out to the west, east, north, and south. Zechariah, under the anointing of the Spirit, he proceeds a little deeper into it. He said, oh, there's more involved here. The people are going to be saved from their enemies. And the mercy of God is going to be shown. And there will be a continual service of God in holiness and righteousness. All that was in that promise. And when the Holy Spirit began to open it up to the people, the extensive breadth of it became breathtaking. But as broad as it was, it was focused. It was a focused promise. Yes, there was mention about a land being given to Israel. Yes, there was a mention of their descendants extending themselves to the cover of the whole globe. But this covenant, that was not the focus of the covenant. The focus of the covenant was that Abraham would be a blessing and the entire world would be blessed through him. Blessing was the focus. God is a God of blessing. 
I think of something old Charles Adam Spurgeon said one time. He said the main thing is to get a blessing. There are many people that have been in church for many years and never been blessed. I don't mean to have a case of the heebie-jeebies or something running up and down your spine either. I'm talking about an acute awareness that God's for you and not against you. That God has sent Jesus to bless you. And turning every one of you away from his iniquities. God has determined to bless the world. And the new covenant is about blessing. That's what it's about. Now our law-binding friends. Well, they're really not our friends. I got to be honest with you. They don't know anything about blessing. They don't talk about blessing. They don't ask God to bless unless they bless the food. Something like that. They don't know anything about blessing. Because law and blessing don't go together. They can't live in the same house. Whenever you talk about law, you've got to get over to Mount Ebal and shout the curses. This promise I'm going to affirm that was given to Abraham that the entire world would be blessed through him. This promise was a prophecy of the new covenant. It, the new covenant is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. Now at this point, <clears throat> I want to reaffirm that the new covenant is actually... The original covenant. It's the first by order of divine objective. The old covenant is called first because it was first by official institution and preparation. But it wasn't first by intention. Or by purpose or by plan. Now the scriptures declare this. In, Genesis, in Galatians the third chapter verses 17 through 20. Take, talking about what we're talking about here. The Holy Spirit says, this I say, that the covenant, the covenant, which was confirmed before by God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serves the law. It was added because of the transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. Now a mediator is not the mediator of one, but God is one. The law came 430 years after the covenant. Or it's also called the promise. My. The new covenant then is not a reaction to breaking the law. It's not a way to undo. It is not a way to undo the curse. Although the curse is undone in the covenant. But the purpose of the covenant is not to undo the curse. The curse is undone so he can give you the benefit of the covenant. The remission of sin is not the focus. The remission of sin prepares you for the focus. The focus is blessing and God can't bless dirty vessels. He cannot do it. God's nature forbids him to do it. You want to go to heaven, you've got to be clean. And law can't make you clean. There's no provision in law for mistakes. No recovery provision under the law. So God uh, gave it by promise, not by commandment. Now you notice the text said, a mediator is not the mediator of one, but God is one. I used to read that verse and I thought, what? And I could tell after I read the commentators, they said, what? Two. But I think I've got it now. Actually, it's pretty plain when you see it, till you see it. <laughs> well, I was reading the wrong people. <clears throat> now, this is a challenging affirmation. What he's saying is ordinarily, under ordinary circumstances, a mediator stands between two parties. A mediator is like Job's daysman that stands between two parties, puts his hand on one, puts his hand on the other. Moses was a mediator. The law was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So Moses stood between God and the people. Good thing for them he did. 
And Moses' chief job as a mediator was to keep the wrath from coming on the people. For a long time, I thought that's the kind of mediator Jesus was. And I talked to some people, well, they still think that's what it is. If it wasn't for Jesus, the wrath of God would be coming on us. Well, there's a system which says true, I understand. But the purpose of Jesus is not to keep the wrath from coming, it's to keep the blessings coming down. That's the purpose of Jesus. Jesus mediate, he mediates the good things to us, yeah. not just keeps the bad things from us. Right. Now, what does he mean when he says, now a mediator is a, me, not a, mediator, a mediator is a mediator of two, but God is one. What he means is this. There was no mediator between God and Abraham when God made the promise. It was directly to him. The new covenant is of a different order. It's not a God and man type situation. It's a divine commitment situation that has been solidified in Christ Jesus the vicarious atonement. And God is at liberty to give this to anyone that wants it. He will bless the whole world from every quadrant of the world. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And every time someone is, the blessing of Abraham has come true again. God is one. This is his commitment, his promise. We are the ones that benefit from it. Amen. He's telling you the difference between a promise. A prom you don't negotiate a promise. The, the new covenant was not negotiated. Abraham, he said to God on one occasion, if you find 50 righteous in Sodom, will you destroy the, the righteous with the unrighteous? Did a little negotiating. God said, yes, I'll spare him. Well, how about 35? Did you do that? Yes. Well, there was no negotiating at this point. Abraham didn't say, wait, wait, wait. Oh, Lord, wait. How about if, we, if I walk a little extra straight, would you uh, give me an extra blessing? No negotiating. God is one. God is divulging his heart and mind here. God is one. It's a revelation of his eternal purpose. <clears throat> now this covenant or promise, and they're used interchangeably, promise and covenant in Galatians, the third chapter, revealed by God to Abraham because Abraham had a propensity toward God. That's what, that's what made Abraham God's friend. I know it says that he obeyed him, but he obeyed him because he had his inclined to God. God didn't have to call Abraham five, six times, beat him on the head, put a hook in his nose. Abraham was disposed toward God. The great men of the first covenant and the before patriarchal periods were men who were sensitive to God. That's what made David a man after God's own heart. That's why God loved Jacob and, and uh, hated Esau. That's why. Because of his sensitivity. Abraham was sensitive to God. He listened and on the basis of his w limited awareness of God, when God promised an impossible thing, he did not stagger at the promise. He believed God, and God says, you're righteous. Amen. Believe me. If you can manage in your heart, and you can, if you can manage in your heart to believe God, it will outweigh everything else you've done. The reign of our Lord Jesus Christ is identified with this Abrahamic promise. My point is the Abrahamic promise was an announcement of the new covenant. In Acts the third chapter, verses 25 and 26, these words, You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first... God, having raised up his son Jesus, <laughs> sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. There had never been language like this before. You could have sat under Gamaliel's tutelage from now till the sun turns the darkness and the moon to blood, and you have never heard language like that. No Pharisee or scribe ever taught like this. He sent Jesus not to tell you what to do, he sent Jesus not to deliver to you a new law. He sent Jesus not to guide you in the straight and the narrow. Although he does all of this, he sent him to bless you. And what, dear Lord, is the chief blessing? 
to turn my iniquities from me, to turn me from my iniquities. I will take away the taste for sin. I will take away the appetite for sin. I will, I will bring a blessing that will leave you hungering and thirsting for righteousness. The Spirit moved from the Abrahamic ministry, a promise, to the ministry of Jesus. It's remarkable. The language is so precise. He fulfilled the promise made to Abraham, in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. He's categorical. And you're the first ones to get it. Hmm. Why? You're the first ones to get it. To you first. Well, Paul later said the gospel, which is the, not the, the proclaiming of the covenant, really. The gospel is the power of God to salvation to the Jew first. Well, there he received it. First, you will no longer be dominated by unlawful desires. There is not a person in the new covenant that will not admit to you, I have wrestled with evil desires. I find another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity, the law of sin and death. But I am not dominated by those desires. When he turns you away from your iniquities, they become repulsive to you, just like they are to God. And you had rather leave your sin than to embrace it. That's a fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. We embrace better things. So the new covenant focuses on salvation, not on the duties of men. Amen. Any view of the new covenant that relegates salvation to the back seat is to be thrown into the theological garbage can and it's getting full. Throw it in there. God doesn't have anything else to offer other than salvation. Salvation is a broad umbrella term that covers everything God has to offer. That's why it's called a great salvation. And the great salvation is nothing but your realization of the new covenant, which is nothing more than the promise God gave to Abraham of old. In that promise given to Abraham, God announced justification. Now, it wasn't clear back there, but as time rolled along, it cleared up under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit to those that proclaimed the word of God. And they saw that actually Abraham got the picture. It was given to him in very abbreviated terms, but here's what Galatians 3, 8 says, that God preached the gospel to Abraham. Telling him that in these shall all nations of the earth be blessed. He preached the gospel. And that signified that he was going to justify the heathen through faith. Who was going to do that? God was going to do that. He gave man adequate time to justify himself. And man could not. At the conclusion of the 4,000 years, uh, the apostle Paul confirmed that it was just as true as it was in David's day, there is none righteous, no, not one. But that's not the way it is now, not in Christ. Amen. Christ has now made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. The Abrahamic covenant fulfilled in us. Any view of the new covenant that does not accentuate justification is spurious. It doesn't make any difference who proclaims it. It doesn't make any difference. They do not know what they're, they're speaking about things that they do not understand. The new covenant emphasizes justification and blessing. In fact, Proverbs 10, 22, even Solomon knew this. You know, Solomon, the older he got, the dumber he got. And he had the best of the world's wisdom, and there's so much for the best of the world's wisdom. huh? That's the, he had the best. But even Solomon knew the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and it doesn't add any sorrow. So when God said, I'm going to bless, he was going to make us abundantly rich Amen. through justification. The promise was a promise of blessing. Now when you read through it, Abraham would be blessed. Abraham would be a blessing. Those blessing Abraham would be blessed. The nations would be blessed. See, it's a, it's, it was a promise of blessing. Some blessings associated with this promise. New covenant is a covenant of blessing. I want to underscore that. A New Testament church is one that has been blessed and speaks of blessing. Amen. And if it doesn't do that, it's not a New Testament church. Right. It's an Old Testament church. Right. 
I would like to go around to a lot of these places that have New Testament and put old over there. Because they operate under the Old Testament. In the first place, that's not even the way the Holy Spirit uses the word. Hmm? New Testament Christian, you've probably heard that. What in the world is a new, is there an Old Testament Christian? What is a New Testament Christian? It's one that's basking in the blessing of the Lord. And if a person isn't basking in the blessing of the Lord, they're an Old Testament person. They're not a New Testament person at all. The announcement of the Lord Jesus was one of the great blessings. I'm showing how this is associated with the Abrahamic promise. Acts 13, 32. We declare unto you glad tidings how, the, which the, how that the promise which was made unto our fathers God has fulfilled. Huh? Our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The coming of the Lord Jesus was the announcement that that promise, that Abrahamic promise, had been fulfilled. No wonder Jesus was called the seed of Abraham in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. He's the one to whom the promise was made. He's the one with whom the covenant was made. He's the one through whom the blessing will be conferred. The Lord Jesus Christ. If you've got Jesus, you've got everything. No wonder the apostle said, uh, don't glory in men. <laughs> because everything belongs to you. Whether it's life or death, things present or things to come, it all belongs to you. You belong to Christ. Christ belongs to God. We're blessed in him. Galatians 3.16 says, the promises, which Acts 3 tells us was the new covenant, the promises were to Abraham and his seed. He does not say seeds as of many, but unto thy seed, which is Christ. The promise is made to him. So the, the new covenant focuses, it's Christocentric. It focuses on Christ Jesus the Lord. Everything is funneled through him. God doesn't start anything. He doesn't start with Jesus, and he doesn't end anything. He doesn't end with Jesus. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha, the omega, the author, the finisher, that's how God operates in the New Covenant because there is no other way to bless humanity. If you're going to get a blessing, it's got to come to the blessor. It can't come through your works. One of the, another one of the key benefits of this New Covenant, which was promised to Abraham, is the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's called a spirit of promise or the promised Holy Spirit. Jesus, you remember, told his disciples about the promise of the Father. He said, wait till you receive the promise of the Father. Now that promise, it is true, was in a unique way to the apostles, but it was not limited to the apostles. The promised spirit. Because Peter said, the promise is also to you. And to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto himself. Galatians the third chapter in verse 14 refers to this uh, to this promise that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. There it is. The Holy Spirit connected with that promise. Which is another way of saying this, see this is how the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. People without the Holy Spirit are like the dry bones of Ezekiel's vision. They do not have the power to do the things of God. Now there's a lot of debate in religious circles about this, I know that, but debate notwithstanding, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Period. Period! We receive the seal, that's his mark, and the Holy Spirit... Uh, enables the promise of Abraham to become true in you. Another aspect, blessing, this is a covenant of blessing, a promise of blessing. I will bless the world is eternal life. If you were to take the blessing of God or the promise of God and boil it down to its essence, what is it? This is the promise that he has promised, even life everlasting. That's the bottom line so far as the blessing is concerned is eternal life or unanimity with God or fellowship with God or being able to be in the presence of God 
and be sustained and nourished by his presence instead of consumed. That's eternal life. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast seen, whom, whom, uh, uh, whom thou hast sent. That's eternal life. And that's the essence of the new covenant. It's interesting to notice that the words eternal life is not in any of the first 39 books of the Bible. That's the King James Version, the New American Standard Version, the New International Version, the New King James Version, and any other version. Eternal life's not in there. Any place. Everlasting life is found once, Daniel 12 and verse 2, speaking about the end of time. Life forevermore, I guess a little close, that's found once in Psalm 133, verse 3. There the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore, and that's it. There was no promise under the law that said, and you shall live forever. Or you will have eternal life. Or you will go forever to be with the Lord. Wasn't in there at all. Eternal life is exclusively associated with the new covenant. It is the exclusive blessing I would to God more people talked about it. Amen. I've heard quite a few quite a few sermons since we've moved to the Bible Belt, but I've never heard a one on eternal life. I've heard a lot of talk about theological issues. I have never heard a breath about eternal life. I'm trying to think and be charitable at this point. I don't know whether I've ever heard anyone say the words. Why not? Because in a theology that's driven by law, you do not talk about eternal life. Amen. There seems to be an awareness in everybody's heart and mind that it's just out of order to talk about eternal life and law-keeping in the same breath. But when you talk about the new covenant, you are talking about eternal life. That was wrapped up in that blessing. And it was a covenant of mercy. The blessing included mercy. Now, the godly walk, you know, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, said that we would live in all holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. The godly walk is possible because of abundant mercy. It's poured out upon humanity, not because they deserve it, but because Christ has removed the obstacle, freeing God to do what he wants to do. See, the transgression was taken away so God could do what he wanted to do. The objective wasn't to remove the transgression. The objective was to blend your spirit with his. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. That's what God wanted. He wanted someone he could fellowship with, someone that could govern his world and his kingdom. Right in the first, he said, Let's make man in our image. That's, let's, let's do that. And let's give the control to him. <laughs> what a purpose, huh? Well, we don't see all things now under mankind, but uh, it's not over yet. <laughs> the glorified man, it is under him. The man Christ Jesus. And soon it will be under us too. See, that's the ultimate blessing. See, the blessing isn't just to get through the world. The blessing just isn't to live a happy life. Or the blessing isn't just to have a happy home. Or to have a flourishing church. The blessing is to be able to get to the other side where the real stuff begins. Amen. Amen. Justification by faith is wrapped up in this promise. <clears throat> Romans, the fourth chapter, verses 16 and 17, unveils this uh, Abrahamic promise from a little different perspective. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise. Okay? That's the promise that we read back. To the end, that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Well, he wasn't just talking about physical pos posterity. Before him whom, whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things, which were not as though they were. Abraham found in his heart to believe that God could make out of him a great nation. That God could bless the whole world through him. Abraham believed that. And I'm going to ask you, do you believe God can keep you from falling? Amen. 
and presents you faultless before His throne with exceeding joy? Do you believe God is able to have you sit with Jesus in His throne? Even as Jesus overcame and sat with His Father in His throne, do you believe that? Do you believe that God is able to give you power over the nations? And to give you power to judge the world? And power to judge angels? And power to reign forever? Do you believe that God can fulfill the word He said to Daniel? He said, the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. And the greatness and the glory and the power of the kingdom under the whole heavens shall be given to the saints. That's what God's targeted in the Abrahamic covenant. Ultimate blessing of the whole world. He has faith, not law, that gets the blessing for you. It qualified Abraham and it will qualify you. It was impossible for Abraham to conceive of having multitudinous seed. Just as impossible as it is for you to believe you can be spotless and pure in his sight without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He refused to stagger through unbelief. And God says, that's it. You have done the greatest thing. That's your work to believe on him whom God has sent. And if you do that, you've got the blessing. I'll tell you, when you have the blessing, you don't much mind whether you have anything else or not. And God's promise to Abraham was not that his descendants would be partially righteous or that Abraham would be partially righteous. Just this last year, there was a class of which I'm uh, aware of to one of my spies. <laughs> and the question was brought up about justification in the class. What about justification? What is First of all, nobody knew what it was. So I explained what it was, justification. Complete acquittal of sin, complete purity, all the sort of things. And now what do you think? Well, is that a, maybe 30%. Maybe 30%. And someone else ventured, eh, 50%, 50% maybe. But another finally said, max out about 70. I don't see how you could be more than 70% justified. They staggered through unbelief. That's unbelief, plain and simple. See, God gives us hard things to believe from the standpoint of flesh, but they are glorious things. The righteousness of faith, the Bible talks about it, the just or the justified one shall live by faith. Amen. Not by doing. Amen. Not by doing. Tonight when you lay your head upon your pillow and you review your works, I do not know all of you, but I can guarantee you none of you will say, Well, Lord, at last I had a perfect day. Hallelujah. <laughs> you will not be able to say that. If Abraham were justified by works, he'd have whereof the glory, but not before God. Your faith is the thing that gives you your worth to God. Just like Abraham. See, the promise was given to Abraham. Abraham believed it, and Abraham's response became the kingdom standard. That's the standard. Abraham's the standard. Us is not the standard. Abraham's the standard. Not even Zechariah and Elizabeth are the standard. Abraham's the standard. Now, oh, by the way, while I'm on it, what great works did Abraham do? What were they? Hmm? If you were to go through the Bible and someone said, I would like you to make a little sheet of paper here about all the great works Abraham did, what, pray tell, would you put down? Maybe how he fought the kings of Sodom and overcome them. That's about it. Faith was his great contribution. God recognized it and said, I'm going to make the posterity your posterity. I'll bless the world. I'll call them righteous on the basis of their faith. The just shall live by faith. Habakkuk said the just shall live by his faith. I like that. And Paul said, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness which is my own, which is of the law. I, I don't want that. Because it won't wash before God. I want the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we are the first to tell you, our righteousness is imputed now. There are flaws in our character. We wish there was not. We wish we could tell you. 
We do not have a spot or wrinkle or any such thing now. We cannot say it, but we're waiting for the hope of righteousness through faith. It's on the way. When you see me standing at the right hand of Christ and I see you, <laughs> there won't be any wrinkle or spot. And faith enables you to wait, patiently wait and endure for that day. Now Paul went on to say if the promise, if the inheritance is gained by law, if it is, then faith is void and the promise is nullified. That's a statement of God. I love to stuff it down the gullet of our legalist friends. And I think the time has come to stop being so blooming merciful with them. You will find that when Jesus and when Paul dealt with these kind of people, mercy dried up and the dove of kindness flew away. Why? Because they're shutting up the kingdom of God. And taking away the key of knowledge. They won't go in themselves and they're stopping the ones that want to go in. Amen. There is no word of kindness given to a person that binds law on other people. You will not raise your finger to lift it. Jesus said. No, the inheritance of his gain by law faith. Scratch it off. There's no point to it in the promise is nullified, then Abraham's just goes down the tube. It's pointless. Faith alone can appropriate the grace of God. Now, law does have a role to play. I know that. I'm not a denigrator of the law. But it's not justification. The law prepares you for Christ. But it cannot give you Christ. The law readies you for remission. But it cannot give you remission. If it could, we would not have needed a promise. All we would have needed was a law. In the matter of salvation, the law is impotent. But the promise is not. In fact, we are made partakers of the divine nature through the promises. The promises. God's commitments. As you think upon them and ponder upon them, they awaken in your heart a desire to have them. When I read the promise of God to Abraham, I said, Lord, do that to me. I want to be blessed. You said you'd bless all the nations of the world. I fit in there somewhere. I want that blessing. And God says, if you will believe me, I will give it to you. What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Amen. Finally, here the true role of the law. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Or in other words, that we might partake of the Abrahamic promise. Remember, the promise was to Abraham and to his seed, capital S. Not seeds as of many, but Seed is of one which seed is Christ. The promise is to Abraham and Christ. Abraham and Christ. The promise is to Abraham and Christ. Galatians 3.29 says, If you be Christ's, then you, you are Abraham's seed Amen. and heirs according to the promise. Amen. <laughs> And his only blessing in the promise. The only curse is people that curse the one that got the blessing. And I'm not about to curse the one that got the blessing. It can be yours. May you as you think back about Father Abraham and the commitment made to him. Be challenged, Lord. I want that kind of blessing. There's an old song we used to sing up in Indiana. I want, I want that kind of blessing that saves and sanctifies and satisfies the soul. You can have it. It was promised to Abraham. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you promised through our father Abraham to bless the world, that we ourselves are tokens of his fulfillment. We pray tonight as each one of us leave and fellowship with one another and think of our 
place in the kingdom of God, we might remember that you sent Jesus to bless us in turning every one of us away from our iniquities. We thank and praise you that you've done this in Jesus' name. Amen.